Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, please share Growcast. Spread the show. Tell a grower about the show. It helps us grow. That's what we do here, folks. Give us a good rating and review, too. Subscribe so you catch every episode. Thank you to the loyal listeners. Today, we have show favorite, Queen of the Sun, back on the line. What up, Queen? Hey, Jordan. How's it going? Going very, very well. Welcome back to the show. It's 420 upon recording this. Happy 420 to you. Happy 420. I am rather stoned. Days. Yeah, yeah, my favorite of all the major holidays, right? All, all of the uh, major observed holidays. 420 is my favorite. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm stoned on some key lime pie. What are you smoking on right now? You know, I've been smoking on OGKB cookies, cookies, cookies. Oh, man. So that's nice. Um, I like that cut. It's really just what I have left, though. So I'm really hoping to manifest some sour diesel or some SFV OG in my life because that really, those are my faves right now, gets me up and going. So hopefully Ooh. someone comes over today and brings me some 420 <laughs> smoke of that. <laughs> that SFV OG, man. Oh my God. A huge part of my NorCal growing career. That cut is prevalent up there. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't know if it still is, but it was, um, you know, let's see, that was seven years ago now when I was starting to shut down my grow. That's fucked up. Wow. Yeah. It, it's still popular. I grew it last season. So, um, and it was one of my favorite smokes of everything that we grew. It's just that get up and go that gas. Yeah, totally. Really good. I agree. Solid strain that SFVOG, but I like the cookies too. You know, a lot of people crap on the cookies. Yeah. It's not everybody's favorite strain. I'm a big fan. I think it's one of the hype ones that I actually enjoy, although I know it's finicky to grow is my understanding and my experience. Yeah, actually, it grew it, you know, in 2016, I started a hash company on the medical side before REC was legalized. And we grew cookies one round in our indoor and it just did not perform like every other strain that we had. But this is in the beginning of my growing career. And I had kept hearing the same thing from dispensaries. You know, it's not a high yielder. Uh, you know, my husband, he grew a lot of cookies, uh, probably the same time, but up in Washington, unbeknownst to each other. And uh, he says that he got a higher yield from cookies um, by putting it around the perimeter of the room where it doesn't get as much light that it prefers modeled light and a little bit of shade. So if you have other strains in your room, putting your um, something that will block the cookies out a little bit, just not, not a lot, but you know, where it isn't as optimal light, wherever, you know, you have that spot in your room or your greenhouse or whatever, um, try putting your cookies plants there. And we saw great success. That is an absolutely brilliant tip. I, uh, I'm in the world of too much light right now. And so you don't know how apropos that is. Yeah. Super, super interesting. And again, that's something that cultivars really prefer different levels of. There is no par meter out there that tells you what this, what uh, optimal range is, what the optimal photon saturation is for this particular strain. You're always going to have to look at your plants and and be wondering. And it can look like a sulfur deficiency or whatever, but for your uh, for your man to realize, no, just move it off to the corner of the tent. I just had to do that recently. Uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Oh yeah. I mean, here outdoor, it's like the sun is so intense that last year we have like one full sun outdoor patch and we have one modeled in the shade Wow! with like surrounded by big pine trees and oak trees. And our biggest plants were in the partial shade. Wow. That's wild. And, and it's, it's because of the strength of the sun there, there and the amount of sunny oh, days. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like 110 degrees like 107 to 110 all of July and August. And so it's just, they need a ton of water and that sun can just, you know, it can be overpowering. I mean, think about if you spend a day out on the beach and all day long, it could be tiring, exhausting. I feel plants are probably, you know, like can't do as much when they're just baking. Oh, a hundred percent. That's a really good point though. And the shaded plants doing better. Super interesting, man. I love it. Yeah. We're going to talk about prepping for outdoor. We're going to get into all sorts of topics here for the grow chat. Before that, though, we were talking off air to continue the 420 discussion while I light up here. Um, you're working with some some old school hash style. Well, I don't know. Cor correct me if I'm wrong. You, you were talking about your work in solventless. I didn't know if I needed to take that as uh, like the ice water style, which I'm so such a fan of, 
or this newfangled rosin, another great solventless method, or both. But what's up with your with your hash making uh, yeah. journey that's starting? So, like I said, in 2016, I started a hash company, but it was all solvents. I didn't, you know, I was new to the game of hash, and I just, you know, we had butane and ethanol wash and just using solvents. That's just what was popular in California. Heptane, all the different hydrocarbons. Um, and I just recently got into solventless because my husband, um, he has cystic fibrosis. And so he smokes like a lot medicinally. And the idea of using hash that may have, you know, residual solvents in it, it's just like the opposite of medicinal in my, in 100%, my mind. 100%. So we've been making rosin at home just with our keef from our trim bins, just squishing it. But we have a buddy coming out here from Washington State. He's supposed to arrive yesterday, but he'll be here tonight. Constellation Carolina. Give him a follow on Instagram. He is such a sweet guy. He works for Constellation Cannabis up in Washington, and he makes yeah. hash for them with uh, Headhunter extracts. Damn. So he's coming out and he's going to teach us how to make rosin, bubble hash, rosin. So we've got a bunch of our trim already made into bubble hash. And then we're pressing the bubble hash into rosin. Right, right. It seems like that that seems to be the way yep. that people were doing it. You know, it's like I see the rosin. And I remember the the kind of uh, what is it called? Hair straightener yep. days on social media. And then recently I was like, Hey, should I press this flower into some rosin? And people were like, what are you talking about? You got to make it into bubble hash first. And I was like, this stuff just moves so fast, but uh, damn queen. That's, that's dope that you get to learn from a master like that. And I'm excited for you. I'm excited too, because I have been out of rosin and hash to smoke and I've just been smoking flour every day. And I'm just, it's just not the same. It does not give you that get up and go. It's kind of just like, this is nice, but I've really been craving that clean, pure hash flavor and just yeah. the high from it. It's so good. The high seems to be very holistic. Um, I, uh -huh. I I tend to get like a, with those critical extracts, you know, the targeted extracts, yep. it tends to be kind of a one dimensional yep. type of stone, especially if you smoke it and smoke it and smoke it. That's that's another thing I've I've realized is the high THC stuff specifically if you smoke a lot of it, it doesn't, it's not medicinal at a certain level. It doesn't feel good. You can, you need that balance, all the other shit in there. Uh, in my oh, yeah. Terpenes and all the bioflavonoids and stuff like that. It's all good. Biodiversity. Yeah. A hundred percent. Speaking of totally taking this off topic, but I just read an article that said you can make isolates from yeast. I think somebody on Instagram posted it, that yeah, you, that it is too. a grow cat. M oh no, it wasn't me. It was, uh, I, th I believe it was MBS, uh, the great Mary Beth Sanchez. Yeah. Had posted. Yes. And I, I saw research on this a while ago, but I think, what did the article say? They just achieved it, right? Yeah. They just achieved it. And being able to pull, uh, isolated cannabinoids from yeast is crazy. And then it goes back to like, what is that really, you know, an isolate? Isolates are just boring and, you know, it's kind of a corporate cannabis takeover, I think. <laughs> Uh, uh, you're breaking up a little bit on us, Queen. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I, I did pick that up. They're they're taking isolated uh, ca cannabinoids. They're growing it with yeast, basically. And uh, Queen was just saying that she's worried about kind of a corporate what, what the corporate takeover implications are if they can kind of bypass cannabis. But to our other argument, I think that it is about that entourage effect. And I don't know what that consumption process is going to look like with the with the yeast THC. But it's not going to be as romantic as the flower, I believe. So hopefully that doesn't happen, but it certainly is a possibility, man. Just uh, the cannabinoids being isolated from this yeast at a low price could be beneficial to things like epileptic medicine, oh, procedures. Oh, that's true. Kids. So true. I don't think we have anything to worry about it infringing on our flower or our culture of cannabis or anything like that. I'm trying to see a silver lining that this is just a way of scientists seeing all the many benefits there are of cannabis and hopefully reducing that stigma so more people light up. Oh, I love that. Love that <laughs> positive take by, by Queen of the Sun. Yes. My God. Absolutely. Yeah. Gotta see the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Speaking of which, why don't we move on to our first uh, major topic here? 
speaking of seeing the sun, I got questions a lot about outdoor and I, I don't have outdoor experience. I, I've, you know, helped a grower here or there, but I've never done an outdoor run. People are asking, you know, what's the optimal time, what zone I'm in, this or that. How can you help my audience understand the proper preparations for an outdoor full queen of the sun run? Okay. So zone is a great question. You know, you, you should start out with that understanding your habitat, where you're going to grow, what your zone is. And that's just giving you a reference for frost dates, you know? So for me, I'm in zone 11B, which is really hot. I think the highest is like zone 13. Oh, interesting. I think most of Americans, you know, zone 7 to 10 is pretty typical growing zone for outdoor. So you want to take in consideration what you're starting to grow with, a seed or a clone. If it's a seed, we talked about this before, you don't need to worry about supplemental lighting. But if it's a clone... The safe bet to put them outside is June 1st. Um, and that will vary oh, according okay. to your, what is it? Your your latitude, you know, like how far away from the equator you are. Yes. Um, yeah, I believe the latitude goes north, south, and the longitude is yeah, east, west. I I think. We, tomato, tomato, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, whichever one is correct. Yeah, no, <laughs> you guys figure that out. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and we're wrong, by the way. Latitude is, is east, west. So I, I just tried to look smart, and I got it completely backwards. So there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it depends on your longitude. That's exactly right. Longitude. Okay. <laughs> how far away you are is going to determine how long your day is, which is going to influence your photo period plants. And it's really the amount of darkness that you have. And so June 21st is the longest or 20th is the longest day of the year. But by June 1st, you have 15 hours solid of light. And then you have your hour of twilight in the beginning and you know, dawn and sunset. Ah, so that gives you an extra right. um, like two more hours of light light. So you're at 17 hours plus of light, that's perfect time to get them out and you don't have to worry about them revegging. Damn. Or flowering and then revegging because a lot of people put them out in May thinking, okay, I got 15 hours, um, almost 15 hours. It's getting close, 14, you know, plus you got your light uh, in the twilight and the <laughs> sunrise. But June 1st, just wait. June 1st. Wow. Okay. Um, I like that. That's later than I might have guessed. Yeah, I mean, I just take it safe and I get my beds prepared before then, obviously, because think about a lot of people, spring is just in full force right now. If you had snow, that's all should be melting. Hopefully you've had your rains and you can choose your site or hopefully you already have your site you know, built. But for me, I'm going to be putting in a couple new sites and I am a huge native soil proponent. So when you determine if you can use your native soil or not, I mean, you can always use native soil, but if there's, you know, a lot of compaction where you can see, you know, heavy machinery had been, most people who live in housing developments have had their entire topsoil scraped off and compacted by heavy equipment. So just planting in your, you know, your yard, mm. you may need a lot more inputs to make it viable for the plant. That is such a good point. I, you, you're so right. With the modern construction practices, I didn't think about, we really just have this weird artificial layer of sod on top of a compacted a construction layer of dirt. That's really yep. what it is. I, I com didn't realize that that wipes out all the fucking fungal colonies or whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everything is scraped solid. So that's what you need to figure out where your starting point is. You know, if you have a property with a lush meadow, then you've got all the native microbes and things going on. Damn. Your water flow is good. You're not going to have compaction. But if you're in a housing development, um, you're probably going to have compaction. And so this is the time to start working on that, which is why that June 1st date is awesome because it gives you time from, from now until then to get your site prepared. I love it. So I actually made a video. I'll be hopefully posting it soon. I just don't have internet. But uh, it <sighs> is showing the most damaged part of our property. That is just like you can see the giant tractor treads in the mud still um, that were from years and years ago. And it's just red baked clay. 
when it rains, the water pools there. And this is how you know this is, you know, you take observations and you can just see where there's good spots to grow and bad spots to grow. But my thought is, hey, what's the purpose of my life right now? It's to like take care of my property, my land, be a steward of all that lives here. And so I thought, this is going to be my goal. Take this battered, scarred, most horrible piece of uh, land on my property and regenerate it. Wow. That's incredible. I'm going to try to grow some plants, some outdoor plants on this nasty, scarred up piece of land. Oh my God. That's incredible. I I love that. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. I've so far, I've got rye, which is good for compaction. Buckwheat, also good for compaction. Daikon radish, another, obviously is the trend here. I'm just trying to break up that soil and it's booming right now. I'm looking at it and it's just what was once cracked red clay is covered in green sprouts that are like three inches tall. I've got rice straw over it and I've been watering it every day and just hoping to keep growing more and more plants there and create, you know, a nice place that we would like to grow. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. I don't even know what to say, Queen of the Sun. That's just, that's like, you're doing God's work there. (laughs) I hope so. That's really cool. So that's what, what I would say, you know, choose your spot, figure out what you need to do with it. Um, there's so many resources online. Your local master gardeners um, will always help you. They are volunteers. They do research based. You don't have to tell them it's cannabis. You just say you want to grow something. I highly recommend reaching out to your local county master gardeners program. They're awesome. Um, and there's just sweet, usually sweet old ladies. So they're going to help you with your garden zone and they're going to be happy about it. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it. So June 1st, um, you got to make sure everything's prepped, obviously. Any other prepping for outdoor tips? Uh, what, what Maybe what the training looks like in that early time period? I don't know. Um, You know, I have, so I have my seeds that I started in February. They're going out as soon as I have my spots prepared, but I also am putting clones out and I'm going to kind of see just how the seed plants do compared to the clone plants here. So your clones, you know, they need the light, supplemental lighting until June 1st, then you're safe. But if you have your clones inside, don't think that they're safe if you're running 24 hours of light and then going to put them outside. You got to wean it down. You know, if you're at 18, which most people, I I don't know, most, that might be not the right word, but a lot sure. of people use 18. Uh-huh. Um, kind of gradually tone it down oh, wow. a few minutes, like 15 minutes a day, a cycle, until you are at the light that is happening on June 1st outside at your home. Wow. Because otherwise you, you, you want to freak them out. Exactly. Exactly. Because you never know what could happen. They could herm. They could plants. And every strain is different and has more sensitivities. So just if you've had your plant this long and you're preparing, just be careful and I like make that. sure your light cycles match up. That's super interesting. And then uh, if you are amending, I was just going to throw out a couple great amendments for your native soil. If you have decent ground that you're just going to dig up, throw your plant in, I would add rice holes for aeration instead of pumice, lava rock, perlite. Um, Rice holes is my number one aeration. Why no lava rock? You know, I just think that it takes away from the aesthetic of my native soil. You can see it when you water. It um, comes to the top. It's just not natural. If you live somewhere that has a lot of lava rock, power to you. But where I'm at, it is clay. And I think that the rice holes are better for my situation. So that is also um, something to take in consideration of whatever your aeration is. You use that. Do you? Mine is rice holes. I like that. I thought thought maybe you had some insight. Like I've heard, for instance, you know, your, your good old perlite is like, it's not good. It's not good for the environment, yada, yada, yada. I was wondering if maybe you had some insight into Lava Rock, but you're just saying you're trying to do things as close as you can to native, to local, all those good things. Plus, you don't like the way it looks, huh? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> rice holes break down. That's true. It's not going to be there forever. So when I'm done with this property or doing what I'm doing, I'm not having something there that's going to be there forever that was not, you know, native to this area. Damn. I guess I got to go grow in Israel then because I like my sand top cover. So, oh, yeah, yeah, we're talking about that. I'm going to have to go grow. I'm going to have to go grow in the desert if, if that's going to be Israel's local. Like, I'm indoors, anyways. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. You can create your own whatever you you can be wherever you want to be indoors. You can pretend like you're in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> I have my Dino Mico from my good buddy Ari, and I hang out in my tent with the sand, and I put my sunglasses on. That's what I do in the Chicago <laughs> in the Chicago winter. That's how I avoid seasonal depression. <laughs> Yeah, wear the Hawaiian shirt yeah, too. Exactly. <laughs> and flip-flops. Oh, man, you nailed it. Uh, what were we saying? So, <laughs> rice holes, right? Yeah, rice yeah. holes. Oh, another cool thing about rice holes is that they break down to 90% silica. Oh, So wow. there's that. I mean, most, a lot of silica is made from rice hole ash. I did not know that. For commercial. So, you know, it adds another layer of silica into your grow once it breaks down and it's food for the microorganisms to make it available. And, you know, we've been talking about silica a lot. There's another natural source of it. I love it. Yeah, exactly. So you got the rice holes for that um, aeration. And then we have talked about the vegan, you know, growing vegan. And so an option that I actually use and didn't realize, oh, well, this is vegan. I do use some things. It's a uh, neem meal. Hmm. So if you've got a vegan growers, um, neem meal, I use that for my outdoor because the microbes love it. The worms love it. I mean, it's just all around awesome and it slow releases for four months. So, you know, your outdoor cycle, it's feeding it the whole time. And that's like a 6-1-2 for NPK. So oh, uh, good nitrogen. Yeah, solid nitrogen boost on that one. Yep. Um, and then glacial rock dust, which, you know, I'm not living near a glacier. So <laughs> my whole point. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry about that. We all have we all have that one thing in our garden where, you know what I mean? Just, just put on your Hawaiian <laughs> shirt and move on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's a great source of calcium, magnesium, iron, trace minerals, cobalt, manganese. Oh, wow. I mean, that has all of your stuff that your micros, um, there you go. You got your NPK from your neem and your micros from your glacial rock dust, uh, rice holes for aeration. And then for a more balanced NPK, I use... Myco Marine, which is by a local farm company, oh. Peaceful Valley. You can look at their website, groworganic.com. They have a bunch of awesome products um, that they make in-house. So I try and you know support the local business. But comparatively, a product to that would be BioLive okay. um, from Down to Earth. Sure, sure. Yeah. So it's pretty similar, um, but the... Myco Marine is a Myco Riza inoculated 554, so an all around fertilizer, Ooh. and it has your beneficial fungus, bacteria, and uses ocean products, which you, me and you have talked about this before. You said something about kelp, you know, like, is it really good for you? And then I've been hearing a lot more discussion of like, ocean is so polluted now. And you know, we've got microplastic yep. and heavy metals. And so like, what is a good alternative for kelp? I, I can't take out sea products. We just had the, we just had the very talented Brandon Rust on our, uh, on our show. Interestingly, talking about vegan growing, not for any um, principal purposes. He claims that it's, it's the only way to grow in his opinion for the exact same reason you're saying. He doesn't use any animal products because our animal chains are all fucked up. And he does testing and he said, that's where you get these heavy metals and these bullshit contaminants and antibiotics and all this. So he's cutting out animal products. I'm like, okay, there's one step. Then he said he doesn't use anything from the sea. So he's using like amino acids and rock dust, like you were saying. That's basically all this guy uses. I don't, I couldn't do that. Huh. I couldn't do that. I'm not, I, uh, he's, I see his point. You know what I mean? The pollution of the oceans. I, I see your point. Um, and I can't imagine those inputs getting worse and worse over time. So I better, I, I'm probably going to have to learn to change eventually, but I cannot imagine. I'm such a fan of the aquatic inputs. Yeah. I didn't ask him if, I mean, I'm sure this was true too. Maybe I did ask him this, if it applied to fish waste products. Yeah, he, I did ask him and he said it does too. I love fish waste products. I don't think I could move away from that in my garden, but you're right. The, the more, yeah, I love the foop, but I, I, um, I don't think I could move away from that in my garden, but shit, God damn, they make sense when they talk about it. You know, he does all that testing. Yeah. That's where he came to these conclusions, yeah. you know? So... So I'm going to try and do some experimenting. And if I come up with a better answer, we'll talk later. I'm going to try growing comfrey this year. I hear 
according to like, you know, the permies, the permaculturists, comfrey is like this biodynamic accumulator and it accumulates a lot of minerals compared to other Mm. plants and it has a relatively fast um, growing cycle. You can harvest it four times a year. But I have found scientific data that validates that these NPK numbers and micro uh, trace minerals are higher in comfrey than other Mm -hmm. plants. So there's always more to explore and we'll see. But I just wondered if you had had an angry you know, recommend something because I love kelp, but I am coming to this conundrum of, I just saw an article that said 95% of the North Coast California kelp forest is gone this year. Jeez. And, but I'm thinking that could also be sensationalized headlines because kelp grows like what, three feet a day and maybe it was just like harvested or something happened. And then, yeah, you know, you two know. weeks later, it's I don't know though. I, I yeah. could see I could see that um, that need to get off of those types of inputs one way or another. So so Godspeed and and uh, yeah, I will dig yeah. I will dig into that because because you're right, man. Okay, me too. That'll be a something we can collaborate on later. Um, you know, it's <laughs> it, it's just crazy. If you if you follow, you have to choose the most important values in your grow and follow the restrictions that are most important to you, and then kind of work your way forward because. What I don't want is for some, God forbid, right? Some first-time grower tunes into tunes into this show and he hears uh, Mary Beth Sanchez talking about all the stuff she doesn't use because of her environmental mind, and then she they we, they hear Brandon Russ talking about all the stuff he doesn't use, and you talking about all the stuff you don't use. They're gonna drive themselves crazy trying to follow all those rules. Uh-huh. So I, I do think it's like you gotta kind of get your feet under the ground, follow the most important values, and then go from there. See if you can improve this or experiment with that. I don't know if you agree with that, Queen. Well, that's what we talked about on the last one. Your holistic goal. What's important to you? What yes. can you afford in your life, like morally, financially, whatever so it true. is? Do you have the time to make your own input? If you don't, you know what? You're making medicine. You're helping improve your life. And you're going to be a better person when you have your own cannabis to smoke. So at the end of the day, I think you're doing a good job if you're growing I love me. that. That's that's wonderful, Queen. We really vibe on that. So, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Before we get back to the great queen of the sun, shout out to AC Infinity. AC Infinity fans are the best fans in the game, baby. The T-Series is their smart series, and it will kick on and off at temperatures and humidities, whatever you need. They are feather light fans, powerful, whisper quiet. And the S-Series is their simple series. You can save a little bit of money on those, and they have a 10-speed van controller, even the simple series. You can't go wrong with AC Infinity. It is a it is a massive upgrade uh, if you're using other fans. Now check out their Cloud Lab series. That's their tents as well. They have that thickness, that extra thick material that people love, but they're pretty affordable. They're pretty dang affordable if I do say so myself. If you can catch them in stock, acinfinity.com, use code GROWCAST15, GROWCAST15 for 15% off AC Infinity. All right, let's get back to the great Queen of the Sun. Wonderful exploration today, Queen. Now, there's one thing on my list here. You actually mentioned something earlier that that alluded to it, I believe, and I wanted to pick it up. You wanted to talk today about protozoa. Uh, you were mentioning, you know, microbes and my, microbes being a wide category of organisms. A, a microbe is just any microbial organism. A mycorrhizal fungi falls into that category. Nematodes fall into that category. I believe mycorrhizal fungi does. Yeah. Microbes are abound. Protozoa is not one that you hear a lot about on cannabis content. Can you talk about protozoa? And I know they're very important in the soil, how they function and how we can kind of like harvest and utilize them. Oh yeah. So protozoa, you know, like you said, we hear a lot about bacteria and fungus, Um, but we don't hear a lot about protozoa. And a protozoa is a single cell eukaryote, probably learned that in biology. And they actually eat bacteria and release nitrogen as well as other nutrients, but primarily nitrogen. So they're you know, a vital part of the soil food web. They're there, they're in there. And if you are developing a site that doesn't have a good soil food web, you may want to introduce, I highly recommend introducing protozoa. And the best way to do that for free and the best species would be what is native to your landscape. And I say this because these protozoa who live around you know the pests that are around you, know the diseases that are around you, know the environment that's around you, and therefore they will survive more readily than 
I don't even know if you can buy a protozoa somewhere on the internet. Probably you could, but why not just do it for free in your own backyard? What does that look like? Yeah. So, what you're going to do. Please. You're going to make a protozoa wash and protozoa are alive in water. So you want to harvest grass or hay, some yard clippings and put that in a five gallon bucket, fill it up with water. And if you're on the city water, you know, that might kill them. <laughs> yeah. You're going to want to treat it with like humic acid <laughs> to and aerate it to get the chlorine out. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm on a well. <laughs> it's bad. It's um, bad out here. Yeah. We just, yeah, it's not looking good. Uh, what about like an RO? You would just recommend tying up those nasty things with some humic acids instead of like going with an RO filter? Oh yeah. I would just say do humic acids okay. um, to tie it up versus the RO for the protozoa because they they want, you know, most natural. They want something in there, sure. So you harvest your green material from the grasses early in the morning when the dew is still on it. Now, this is recommended by a compost company. I took a workshop with them and this is their recommendation. But I have also read that if you were to take dry grass and add it to water, you would also find protozoa eventually because protozoa actually don't die when they dry up. They they get encysted. So they create a cyst around themselves Whoa. that hardens and protects them so that they can survive until they get water again. Dry grass clippings you could try That's and incredible, also try green grass clippings. And if you go to the happyscientist.com, I read his little science experiment that argued basically you could use dry cl grass clippings as well as, you know, green. The only difference is that you have to, you know, re-inoculate or wake these protozoa up that are on the dry grass versus the dew where they're alive and swimming around already Whoa, in that water. That is crazy. Yep. So one third of your five gallon bucket filled with green material. If you were going to do dry, I would recommend doing, you know, like probably two thirds double because, you know, it's just less everything when you're dry. You have less water, therefore probably less of everything. I would just recommend doubling if you use dry. And then fill that up with your treated water. Allow it to sit for 24 to 48 hours. And then strain out your green material. So maybe you put your green material or your hay into a tea bag and have it soak and then pull that out and then aerate the water for another 36 hours. And you can at this point add whatever you want to add to your, you know, make it. If you're going to go through all this trouble of bubbling something for 36 hours, I would add, you know, like kelp or alfalfa meal or something other than just so that you get, you know, some nutrients in there to feed your plant as well as the protozoa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then just bubble that 36 hours and you're ready to go and you can add whatever. I always add things at the end of my teas. After I've bubbled, I put in my surfactant, either yucca or aloe. I will put in a fulvic or a humic. But if you treated your water beforehand with that, then you don't need to worry about it. But yeah, then you're inoculating your native protozoa that you just harvested out in the wild into your plant. That's incredible. So what can you expect to see? I know you say that they, they create the nitrogen from consuming bacteria, but what, what are the major cannabis related benefits from adding protozoa to the food web? Just, you know, basically that it's just adding to your, your soil food web, making sure that everything's running properly. It's nutrient cycling. It's increasing the speed of nutrient cycling so that if you are using living soil, you want to always be increasing that nutrient cycling so that the plant has a bit, as many available nutrients as it wants at any time. Because a lot of the time with living soil, you have things that need to be broken down that aren't available for your plant immediately. So this is just to add to your, your microorganism. And we see a lot of bacteria being sold and a lot of fungus being sold. But protozoa are important roles in cycling through, they eat bacteria. And so uh, cannabis is actually a fungal dominant plant and doesn't want a high level of bacteria. So if you, let's say you have a media that is completely sterile that you're starting out with trying to build up a 
food web in and you have added your bacteria, you've added your fungus, but you're inside, you've never had a protozoa in there. This is just going to add another layer to your garden to make sure that your bacteria don't get out of control because a lot of people are constantly making bacterial teas and cannabis is fungal dominant. Wow. So let's focus on the fungus and protozoa has a relationship with all of that. Wow. And yeah, it seems to really consume that and cycle that bacteria. And again, echo- echoing what other guests have said as far as like reapplying the compost tea over and over and over and over might not be quite as optimal as different approach. So super, super interesting. I like that. The protozoa harvest and application just from grass clippings. That's a game changer. Seriously. Appreciate that. Uh, whoops. Appreciate that tip. Of course. I just dropped my pipe on the ground. It's a 420 disaster. It's not broken. Oh no, that's so awful. <laughs> Gosh, I hate breaking glass. That's like the worst luck. It's like worse than breaking a mirror, I think. <laughs> it's like 10 years of bad luck. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. On the subject of microbiology and bacteria, you know, the very first microbe product that I ever introduced to my garden was the uh, mammoth microbes. My, uh, uh, Jesus, oh, yeah. why, how am I blanking on this? Mammoth P. Of course, the P, the P standing for phosphorus, you know, this phosphorus solubilizing and phosphorus, uh, you know, widening the uptake range bacteria. Yep. That kind of became one of the, I, I know Recharge has been around for a while too, and Herb Naturals has been around for a while, but that one really, I feel, kind of cemented microbes in the grower lexicon. Oh, yeah. Are you a fan of those uh, phosphorus microbes? Oh, yes. When I first started growing, I was learning in an indoor setup using advanced nutrients, bottle, bottle, bottle. And that was the first microbe I used that was available in that garden. And that kind of got me started into looking into microbes and learning about Elaine Ingham and learning about the soil food web. And so Mammoth Pea is, you know, that's one of the, the first products I that introduced microbes to me. That's incredible. That set you off on a whole regenerative path just by their little, their little microbe company. Uh, no, I was. Oh, okay, I see. No, I was in school for environmental science, and I was also learning growing at the same time. And I was like, "Whoa, the person who's teaching me is growing this way," but my heart tells me I, I want to grow see. this way. And I used application of sustainable agriculture in cannabis, and I thought, "Hey, cannabis is the plant, man. Like, why do we have to do all these crazy things that are?" different from other plants when earth has been earth is perfect you know she's got her cycle she does everything she knows better than i do so why not mimic her instead of buying a freaking plastic bottle with a big boob cartoon and a tomato <laughs> bag? of course of course the big boobs help sell the the plant it makes, it makes perfect sense right it, it literally yep. it makes perfect sense brand wise <laughs> Sorry, dripping with sarcasm there. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. That, that, yeah, that's that's like almost a Shakespearean play. You were you wanted to follow your heart, and then you did, and now look where you are. <laughs> exactly. I love that. Uh, I actually have read some white papers. You know, scientifically reviewed experiments held on p- mammoth pea and corn in Iowa. I believe Cornell might have actually done the study. And Cornell, if you don't know, they are like one of the top agriculture schools in the nation they have had they have a field that has been used for experiments since the 1700s whoa that's cool well corn is right in their name of course yeah yeah sorry. corn cornell that's why I had to. <laughs> i'm sorry cornell. that's corny as shit uh, i love it so funny <laughs> so uh the corn with mammoth pea application the yield was just it, it increased exponentially. I don't know the exact numbers, but I believe between 20 and 30% increase in yield with mammoth pea. Um, and that was in conjunction of a uh, phosphorus fertilizer, sure. but it also increased yield without application of fertilizer. So mammoth pea works best in conjunction, but it will also improve your yield without adding a fertilizer. If you're just going to have, you know, let your plant grow without anything adding anything 100 percent. that's that cycling that occurs with so many minerals i don't i don't know yep. if phosphorus in particular but uh you know it's just more of a, the philosophy there of microbes creating this more efficient system and sometimes a closed virtually closed loop system with the way that they cycle so super interesting yep. 
Yeah. So I have a recommendation and I hope that this website is still up because it's a really weird, like outdated, you know, 2000s website, HTML kind of thing. Um, but it's called Custom Biologicals Inc. And they sell microbes online for commercial agriculture. And they sell like very highly concentrated bottles that are tiny, like, I don't know, 60 milliliter bottles or 100 milliliter bottles, something. And that treats like 2.5 hectares, which is a lot of space. I don't know what a hectare. No, <laughs> We've talked to, about this, but it's a lot. Of it acres. is, yeah, that's hilarious. So wait, this is the same thing. This is a this is a similar phosphorus bacteria. Uh, yeah, they sell all different kinds of bacteria, and I got to shout out Foggy Top Farm again because he gave me this recommendation. It's twenty seven dollars for this tiny little bottle that you use like a dropper full. Oh man. Okay, so pinch in your reservoir. Man, this this looks incredible. I was it was funny because I I googled this company and I was I, I was about to say, how dare you? Of course they're still up and running. And I clicked on their website. Yeesh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. No, it's not that bad. Right. It's just a, it just looks a little bit outdated. <laughs> is all. It looks like Biotamax is their soil probiotic and biofertilizer. But then yep. they also have the Custom GP, which is their Trichoderma. Yep. You just piqued my interest. Oh, Buy yeah. trichoderma oh. here. Yes, please. Let's do this. I bought that one. Uh -huh. It's the five strains, I believe, of the trichoderma. And then I bought the B5. Oh, sorry. So it's four strains of trichoderma. And then B5 is five strains of bacteria. And they're all different types of bacillus. And those have... Between trichoderma and bacillus, you can find hundreds of scientific papers on how their relationship in increasing available phosphorus oh, for plants. Damn. So another thing that is scientifically proven they do is combat botrytis. So you have your fungus and your bacteria that you can inoculate. You know what they do. And it's like $30 for a bottle that will last you probably, I mean, depending on your size, it's lasting me. It's, I've had it for a year and I've only used it twice and I still have almost a full bottle. So Keep it in a cool place. Highly recommend checking them out if you're into making your own and trying to save money because Mammoth P is like, I love it, but it's pretty expensive. It is. It definitely is. And I know that sometimes you've shared these type of hacks before where you can find, uh, you know, the active ingredient and in cloning gel for much cheaper or whatever it may be. So yep. I'm a big fan of this. And I, I, since we've been talking, I'm kind of multitasking here. I'm trying to figure out how to order through this website and I... I'm struggling. So yeah, I'm, yeah it's I'm really sorry. hard. And you know what? Just they send real. you the bottles in the mail with nothing, no instructions, oh no gosh. nothing on it. It's just like treats 2.5 hectares. That's all. Okay. I'm like, uh, what? what? So you have to do conversions. You have to do math and you have to like put in more work. But you know what? Mammoth P is like, what, a hundred bucks? This is 30 and... I don't think they're definitely not the same um, bacteria. I don't think. I don't know what the active bacteria is in mammoth pea, but I know that they solubilize insoluble phosphorus for plants as well as outcompete botrytis, protecting your roots. And you can use it as a foliar if you wanted to, to protect your plant tissue as well from these fungal diseases, pathogens. So I just added the. Custom B5, the bacillus, like you said, and the trichoderma product. I eventually found the product pages. I'm absolutely going to try these in conjunction with each other. The one thing that I will say about your uh, mammoth peas and your king crab, for instance, which also has, it has many, many bacteria, but it has the uh, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. You use very, very little per application, specifically the king crab. I've, I've actually never seen a smaller application. Still overpriced, but I will give them that. At least you're not using a lot. But I'm excited to try these, uh, this trichoderma and and uh, bacillus combo together. It's only, you know, 80 bucks out the door. Super excited. Yeah, and you'll probably have it for years. Killer. So I don't know how long they, I think, I mean, bacteria lay dormant in like volcanoes forever and at the bottom of the seafloor. I don't think that they'll, you know, I'm sure that they have a shelf life, but wow. if you give them the right environment to proliferate, I'm sure that they will come back. Love it. So 
Yeah. And I would do it in conjunction. I'm going to, um, so I applied both of the products that you bought to my garden last year in as a soil root drench. And then also this year in the beginning before plants were in just to make sure that that colony was there because I did have a uh, botrytis growing on my cover crop before Uh-oh. I planted. So I was like, okay, the buckwheat, the botrytis loves the buckwheat at, when it's dead. So I haven't seen a single spore of anything and I've been, you know, it was a good month before planting that it was completely cleaned out. And I really saw a huge difference in botrytis growing with that. So pretty cool stuff. And then I would probably, I'm going to do it again, um, week three and four of flower. So right when I want to give them that boost, I'll get, figure out what kind of food I'm going to give them, you know, what kind of phosphorus source. Because it's different. Last year I used, I did use a bottle. I used HPK. I think it's roots. Mm-hmm. but I don't recommend that. I'm going to try and find something that is, you know, more in tune with my holistic goal. But, you know, do what you got to do and add those microbes and you will get more out of it than you would otherwise because phosphorus is a mobile nutrient and therefore it will completely flush out of your media with water. It binds to water. And if you aren't applying it or have it in, you know, a phosphate form, in your soil and it's in some kind of a liquid nutrient and it runs out your, the bottom of your, your pot or whatever, that's gone. Like that phosphorus is just so true. Yeah. And your plant can gobble so much of it, especially if you're sitting under one of those newfangled led lights, you know how much, you know how much phosphorus and, and potassium and uh, just so, so many of those nutrients are calcium and magnesium. Your plant is going to be gobbling up under that much, uh, under the, that, that many photons. You're really going to want to up that and make sure that your mi- microbiology is on point to keep up with it. I, I couldn't agree more, Queen of the Sun. Yep, yep. Lovely yep. place to wrap it up. As usual, you are an excellent guest and you bring the heat every time. So thank you so much. Maybe for some first time listeners, where can they find you? Give out all your all your awesome stuff. Oh, yeah. You can find me at Queen of the Sun Grown on Instagram right now. That's all you, where you'll find me. I am a full time mom right now. So limiting it to Instagram. That's it. That's That's all. all. Go and follow. You won't regret it. And uh, stay tuned for more Queen of the Sun. Such a wonderful regular guest of the show. You can find Growcast at Growcast on Instagram. Find uh, me in our Discord every single day. And uh, most of those channels are members only for patreon.com slash Growcast. Membership growing every day. Loving it. Appreciate you subscribers, you members, all of you. This is Queen of the Sun and Jordan. What's that? Happy 420, man. I literally <laughs> forgot by the end of the episode. I was, I was, I, I was so enamored with uh, with the conversation that we were having that I have forgotten for the second or third time today that it is 4:20. Uh, this means you're having a good 20. Happy 4:20, everybody! I'm sure this is by the time you're hearing this is past, but I hope you had a good one. This is Queen of the Sun and Jordan River signing off, saying be safe and grow smarter. Happy gardening. That's our show, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Special thank you to Queen of the Sun. Isn't she lovely, folks? Before we wrap it up, Purity Coffee. A lot of people have been asking me. You know, I talk about Purity Coffee a lot. And I have a code for you guys. If you do want to upgrade your cup, you know, you smoke the finest weeds. Why don't you upgrade your coffee from the mids up to the dank? PurityCoffee.com. Use code RIVER. 20% off and free shipping. I've been getting that request a lot. So I thought thought I'd throw it here. Purity's the best, folks. PurityCoffee.com. Use code RIVER. Thank you so much. Shout out to Jay Blanked on SoundCloud for doing the beat. Shout out to Illinois Canna Consulting, of course. Shout out to all the listeners, all the members. I appreciate you guys. See you next time on Growcast.